And as we move past the Golden Age, we move into the Age of Dynasties from 1984 to 2005. That 20 year period of bodybuilding would be dominated by three men, each one of which moved the goalpost further and further and put the pressure on everybody else to keep up. This is what would become the age of mass monsters. To start, we have Lee Haney, who became the next quantum step forward in bodybuilding, so much so that the Haney era is often used to describe his run post golden era. Haney won eight consecutive Mr. Olympia titles, beating Arnold's record of seven, sporting thicker legs and shoulders than Arnold, but with a similarly small waist. At five foot 11 and 230 pounds, or 105 kilos, and low body fat, we were beginning to see what true conditioning looked like. Lee Haney was a different animal than the similarly weighted Steve Reeves or Reg Park. He was shorter, sure, but the difference between 10 and 12% body fat that Reeves and Reg sported and the 5% or less body fatted of Haney was the difference of 12 to 15 pounds of pure muscle tissue, meaning at the same weight, you have a dramatically different physique. The Haney era concluded with the rise of Dorian Yates, who won six consecutive Olympia titles between 1992 and 1997. If Haney was a step forward in the sport, Dorian was a full jump with a running start. At five foot nine, he stepped on stage at 260 pounds or 120 kilograms. Now we've covered 260 pound bodybuilders before, but Gorner had a body fat well into the 20% range and Ferrigno was six foot five. That similar amount of weight on a smaller frame with an enhanced element of conditioning meant that there was just a bigger human being on stage than we had ever seen before. Now, Dorian was a late starter, picking up the sport at 21, and within nine months looked better than many 10-year veterans. He would grow to proportions the sport had never seen. And Pandora's box had been opened. At this point, it just couldn't be shut. Now, it's important to point out that just like testosterone and Dianabol changed the face of the silver and golden era, this modern jump in size was also helped along by the use of growth hormone and insulin through the 1980s and 90s, in addition to the continued use of oral and injectable steroids. The surge in sizes led to thicker waists and bloated bellies, and that's a controversial swing in the sport that has only recently started to reverse. As we move into the 90s, we have who is still argued to be the greatest of all time, and that is Ronnie Coleman. The reign of Dorian led immediately to Ronnie with his amazing size, standing on stage at a ridiculous 300 pounds at under six feet of height, and he was only slightly taller than Dorian. At a body fat under 5%, his physique looked more like that of a racehorse. Now, Ronnie Coleman was one of the few bodybuilders to actually have a day job and footage of Ronnie in full contest prep, scarfing down playing chicken breast by the pound while working as a police officer in uniform. Still just, it brings a smile to my face. Ronnie's size was unmatched, even by the other mutants of his day who were desperate to keep up to try to claim the Olympia title. Ronnie had eight consecutive wins from 98 to 2005, which meant every time he showed up, he beat the likes of Kevin Lavrone, Dennis James, Demarcus Rule, Nasser El Sambadi, Gunter Schlierkamp, and eventual four-time Olympia winner, Jay Cutler. As of 2005, every single Olympia winner since 1984 was either Lee Haney, Dorian Yates, or Ronnie Coleman. Now to compare the dynasty training methods, starting with Lee Haney, his training wasn't groundbreaking from the previous generations we've covered, but he had some idiosyncrasies himself. Using three to five sets of six to 15 reps, he would work muscle groups twice per week, further splitting them into AM and PM sessions for four distinct workouts. This allowed greater effort for more of the work, which fit Lee's specific focus on getting as much out of each set as possible. Where so many preach the importance of strict control, Lee was unashamed to claim that effort took precedent. Absolute failure is more important than all the technique in the world, according to Lee. Now he preferred to stay with movements he liked instead of opting for constant rotation. So instead he varied the rep ranges to keep things fresh. He conceptualized weight into the model of mass and sculpting. It was thought that heavy weight and low reps was important for building raw mass and that higher reps somehow provided a shaping or sculpting effect. This superstition wasn't new as the experience of high rep pump workouts is entirely different than power workouts, including the way the muscles look after. So it kind of stood to reason that adaptations within the muscle might be different too. However, we know now that all muscle growth is essentially the same. And while different movements can have some impact on where the tissue is grown within a muscle, the rep ranges do not. Muscle gained with low reps is not structurally different than muscle gained with high reps. And the current thinking is that three to 30 reps is similarly effective at building muscle. That assumes that each set is taken relatively close to failure. 
Now, despite this, Haney's approach was not any less viable. Alternating heavy and light days was an example of DUP, which is a commonly used tactic when training muscles or movements twice per week and is indeed correlated with improved results. Daily undulating periodization just simply means you're working different rep thresholds on different days, and it provides an element of, of variety that allows you to continue training at a high frequency. Heavy weight has an added benefit in that it does train the nervous system, which means that muscles gained with threes or fives comes along with greater strength. If heavy workouts are useful for getting big and the strength that comes with it allows bigger training efforts, causing more growth in turn, then one would want to lift heavy all the time. But as so many lifters find out, this is not sustainable. In addition to risk of injury or overuse issues, frequent heavy workouts are hard to recover from and the efforts are not predictable, which means it's difficult to continuously set PRs. But if you use a lighter day that focuses on metabolic fatigue from driving blood into the muscle, muscle can be grown and the joints are generally happier for it. It is a very useful strategy. Now moving on to Dorian, known for his high intensity approaches that were somewhat similar to Menser's, he posted his workouts during his formative years from 1982 to 85 when he first started lifting and it took him from this to this. Guys, if I can help fund this channel and help you solve a problem, I call that a win-win. So please allow me one moment to preach the good word of Boost Camp. I tend to get a little complex when I'm writing workout plans. Tracking progress for these programs is hugely important, but options were never great. I would write these long, complex progressions by hand into a notebook, or I would carry a binder filled with spreadsheets I printed off of LiftVault. That's why I'm here to introduce you to Boost Camp. Boost Camp is the easy way to track training progress directly from your phone. Their library of programs features countless dozens of powerlifting and hypertrophy specific programs from your favorite creators, including Jeffrey Verity Schofield, Johnny Candido, Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles, Alberto Nunez, and of course, yours truly. Boost Camp also has exclusive programs that you just won't find anywhere else. Select the one best suited to your needs and watch the sets, reps, weights, and exercises populate automatically. Don't guess at that one weight you lifted that one time for how many reps again? Have your log of training with you at all times for easy reference in the convenience of your phone. Not only does Boost Camp have a stellar product, but their support is the only reason this channel exists. So thank you, the viewer, and thank you to Boost Camp. Check it out today. The link is in the description. Dorian used a two-day split, averaging three exercises for bigger muscles and two for smaller ones, taking the sets to failure and adding weight if they exceeded eight reps. So his efforts were notably heavier as he was often training below eight reps, and that might have contributed to his run of injuries late in his career. However, he was also following up that heavy work with continued post-failure work, getting into much later rep ranges. So it was almost the consolidation of heavy and light work into one set. Now, Dorian claims that after a year, he employed forced reps, suggesting that post-failure techniques were eventually necessary or otherwise a good idea after an introductory period, but in the beginning, as he was a newbie, not so much. So that's a sign to you guys that are just starting out. You don't necessarily need to start with 21s and forced reps and drop sets. Just simple progression is good enough in the beginning. Now, notable to Dorian was his infrequent approach. Those who train muscle groups once per week typically do an immense amount of work, and those who do less work usually train a muscle group two to three times per week. Dorian was in the middle, rejecting splits that went off a seven day week. He would average a muscle group three times every two weeks for a one and a half times frequency. Now, it's been suggested that Dorian trained with more volume than he let on, where most people fixate on the one set to failure, his training actually included several warm-up sets for higher reps. He wouldn't count them as work because I'm sure they didn't feel like work compared to the actual sets, but fatigue and total accumulated reps still do play a role in volume and growth. It is not negligible. Volume is not just the work that is done to the absolute limit. Now, how much of a role it plays is unclear and it's often debated. Now, looking at his recommendations from his Blood and Guts book, he specifically says that he chose more work for bigger muscle groups. This is another bodybuilding paradox, as one might think a bigger muscle needs more work to grow, but others point out that bigger muscles can put out so much work that they take much longer to recover. So which is it? Do smaller muscle groups get more work throughout the week because they're smaller and bounce back faster, or do they get less by virtue of being smaller and not needing as much work? Dorian specifically says five exercises for a big muscle like back and two exercises for a smaller muscle like biceps, each with several warm ups and two all out working sets in opposition to Mike Menser's one. 
It is worth pointing out that Dorian was known for having one of the thickest, biggest backs in the game, yet biceps were often considered a weakness of his. The volume certainly correlates with his results, but is there a causal effect? Was the difference in volume responsible for the difference? We can only speculate. While Dorian's training is nowhere near the volume of those who would do seven movements for 20 plus total sets per muscle group, his higher rep warmups, followed by two balls out, two and beyond failure sets, don't look quite as low volume as most people think, and it's reasonable to think it had some role in his freakishly big physique when you compare his work to something promoted by Menser or Arthur Jones. In fact, Mike Menser was even known for trying to convince Dorian that he should be doing less work, which is a weird thing to suggest to somebody whose physique literally changed the face of bodybuilding over a several year period. And then lastly, in the Dynasty era, we have Ronnie Coleman, who competed in powerlifting before bodybuilding and thusly was no stranger to heavy ass barbell work. Where Dorian preferred the precision and control allowed with machines, dumbbells, and cables, Ronnie was perfectly comfortable moving maximal loads as he was doing barn burning, high rep, high fatigue sets. He was known for benching 500 pounds for reps, squatting and deadlifting over 800 pounds, and throwing around the 200 pound dumbbells. In his immortal word, Anybody want to be a bodybuilder? But don't nobody want to lift no heavy ass weight. Ronnie seemed to be a throwback to Lee Haney, prioritizing fluid explosive reps with a minimally controlled negative and a specific focus on explosive effort on the way up more so than strict control. In the opinion of Justin Harris, this is actually an optimal approach. I think the best training is essentially what Ronnie Coleman did, which if you watch the way he trained, it was bad form. We talked about this yesterday too. Bad form because he never locked out and yeah. he lifted explosively. But it, it appears, and there's some data to, to you know, correlate with this, it appears that uh, explosive concentric motion, not a lot of worry about the eccentric other than avoiding injury and then constant tension on the muscle, which is how we train. You watch them do like shoulder press, it's, it's this. Mm -hmm. While it is far from conclusive, it has been pointed out that Ronnie didn't suffer joint issues throughout his career, except for the back incident that led to a botched surgery that left him disabled now. But Dorian, on the other hand, had his career ended by injuries from the work he was doing with low volume and with machines, which theoretically should be easier on the joints. So one can ask, did the fluid explosive style of Ronnie Coleman actually save his elbows, knees, and shoulders? Or is it the result of other factors like genetics and what we observe is purely coincidental? We can only speculate. Now Ronnie's routine pushed volume to the limit, performing a push-pull leg split twice per week, each workout lasting two hours and going upwards of 40 sets. Having started training as a powerlifter, Ronnie's preference was for heavy ass free weights over machines, when you consider the extra taxation to the rest of the body that comes with things like bent rows, squats, and deadlifts, and you pair that with all of the work that has to be done, the immense grueling effort with short rest periods, it really makes the work that Ronnie did all the more impressive. Could Ronnie recover from these workouts because of his years training with them, like adapting over time to that type of grueling prescription? Or did he have some innate ability to recover that allowed him to grow from that in the first place? Even if you credit his recoverability to massive steroid use, that is not something that can be done by most of the people that take massive amounts of steroids. So again, we can only speculate. Now here we have three back-to-back -back Olympia dynasties, three game changers who challenged what was possible and each one with their own idiosyncrasies for training. Now the common theme here, if you haven't guessed, is effort. Everyone verbalized the importance of effort in training. Haney in supporting effort over technique. Yates with his post-failure tactics that earned his training the title of blood and guts. And Ronnie with his lack of hesitation to get under impossibly heavy weights when he was fatigued from dozens of sets, getting closer and closer to failure each time. The discussion of effort is similar to progressive overload. The concept seems simple, but there are many applications, just like progressive overload can be increases in weight or volume, can be done instinctively or on a schedule, can be done slowly or rapidly. Effort encompasses many different ideas. Dorian, along with Menser, advocated training to failure that wasn't actually failure, but post-failure training. The real blood and guts happened after you reached failure, when your partner would assist you through force reps, then when you would drop weight, then continue through partials. It almost seems disingenuous to call it one set as the ordeal might take two minutes to get through. It's perfectly rational that this might take the place of more than one working set 
in a traditional workout style. With Ronnie and Haney, fluid continuous movement was key, and that allowed fatigue to build faster and continuous tension to stay on the muscle with more weight than they would have otherwise experienced. Dorian's machines featured a different strength curve than free weights, meaning the muscles were under tension the entire rep, whereas free weights have kind of a sweet spot where the target muscle is under the most tension. The point between a full stretch and that sweet spot seems to be where growth is maximized with free weights, which is why you see so many bodybuilders pulsing through length and partials in a bid to torch the target muscle and emphasizing the stretch, if not as part of the exercise, then between exercises. So as for volume, nothing is conclusive with the world's most gifted bodybuilders. We can look at Haney and Ronnie with their two times per week multi-set free weight marathons and credit their size and success to the amount of work, just as we can credit Dorian's back to receiving more work than his biceps. But there is no way to know what other factors might have influenced their growth or what they would have achieved if they went with the opposite style of training. Dorian put it best in his book. You've got to experiment and find what works for you, your body type, your goals, etc. Whatever training method you choose, the bottom line is that you have to overload the muscle on a progressive basis and give it plenty of time for repair and recuperation in order for it to become bigger and stronger. 